Turning now to the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 11 and verse 24. Hebrews 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Well, this is concerning Moses of ancient times, three and a half thousand years ago. The title of my message is The Like That Lasts Forever. Now Moses is seen here at 40 years of age. People extraordinarily don't know and don't appreciate that Moses was far and away one of the greats of world history, if not the greatest in world history, apart, of course, from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But for someone who was only a man, Moses was an astonishing figure, and in many ways. Of course, for something like 40 years and over, he led the Israelites of old, two million people, from bringing in abject misery in captivity as slaves in the land of Egypt into their own land as an organized people with laws and a system and the most refined people imaginable on earth at that time. In spite of their resistance, what a leader he was. Yes, by the hand of God we know, and with the help of God, but what an astonishing feat to so lift up a people and to be their leader for so long. And you know, power never got to him. It never affected him. Lifelong, he was the most approachable of men. He's described in the record of scripture as the meekest of men, the humblest of men. To the end of his life, he was the same, open and available, concerned for his people more than for himself. An extraordinary man, who do we know in world history? Unaffected, unruined, unspoiled by power and influence. And yet he is in his own right, of course. God used him, God was with him, but the evidence is that in his own right, he's a mighty man of letters. As the Bible is presented to us today, the first five books of the Bible are by the hand of Moses. He was a poet. We have Psalm 90 and, of course, other productions to demonstrate this. His handling of Hebrew poetry was magnificent. That phrase, for a thousand years in thy sight, are but as yesterday when it is past, has been cited by one great poet as the outstanding form and display of words. Well, that's only the English translation. Remarkable and capable man. A leader I've already mentioned. A prophet in his writings. There's so much prophecy. Short-term prophecy, which has already come to pass. Medium-term prophecy, prophecy, which is in the process of coming to pass. And long-term, distant prophecy. He was a man who was amazing in many regards. At 40 years of age... He was still in Pharaoh's court. He was brought up as a son of a daughter of Pharaoh. He was a kind of crown prince himself. It is very possible, if not probable, that he might have been a Pharaoh himself, though we can't absolutely be certain of that. He was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He knew all the philosophy of his time. Different passages of scripture hint and show us what he did, what he accomplished. He was a general in the Egyptian order for all those years. He was also a constructor, possibly even an architect, but a supervisor of building projects. 
from, from behalf of the crown. He did so many different things and capabilities in his life. But the record here is from the time he was about 40. And I read it again to you. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, that's the description here of his turning 40. Doesn't mean his coming to years so much as when the time was ripe for God to use him. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He renounced his Egyptian citizenship and all the privileges that went with it. Choosing rather, literally selecting, preferring, selecting for himself. It's a Hebrew term which might be referred to selecting a foodstuff, an item of food, or selecting a route or a road to travel down. He selected rather something better is implied, to suffer affliction with the people of God, with the Hebrews, he was a Hebrew, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ or the contempt he would receive for serving the people of God who would bring forth Christ, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. When was Moses, as we might ask today, when was he saved? As a child, did God touch his heart, make him a man of true prayer and belief in the Hebrew scriptures and the one true God as opposed to the multiple gods of the Egyptians? At what stage? As a child, as a teenager, as a young man, shortly before the age of 40 when he was called? Well, I think it must have been earlier rather than later, but we're not told the answer to that in the scripture, but it must have been some time before God actually put his hand upon him and called him to follow him in the great mission of bringing freedom to the Israelite slaves and forming them into a nation. It must have been some while before. Can you just imagine the decision which confronted Moses to leave his station and his privileges and his life and lifestyle. There was such scope for his abilities and his powers, so many luxuries and comforts. Of course, there was a downside. Presumably, it was difficult for him to live and survive, even with authority, without deference to the religion of Egypt without being one who would worship the multiple gods. They worship cats and goats and the sun and the Nile. There was great cruelty in the Egyptian court and way of doing things. And that all, well, Moses would have recoiled from it all. It may be that a voice within him said at one stage, yes, but if I continue, and supposing I become Pharaoh or become one of the key officers of state in the nation in the future, surely I will be able to do good. Just some compromises, some show of deference to Egyptian religion, some things will be difficult, but surely by staying here, the place I know, with the privileges and the power and the respect and the obedience and the orderliness of the Egyptians in those days, all this could work for the good, for the benefit of the Israelites, of the Hebrews. Maybe he was tempted, but if he was, he rejected it all. He knew that was impossible that he had to come clean. You had to be either for the false religion or for the true, either living alongside all the cruelty and treachery, or you had to be for a life for God, which was honest and uncompromised and clear and apart. And the service of the living God would mean leaving all that. But to prefer to do that, to give up the order and the honor and all the comforts and the things he knew 
and was expert in and go over to a people who at that stage in their history have been described as a brickyard rebel. They had been coarsened, they had no order, they were pathetic, they had been downtrodden, they couldn't any longer represent themselves or defend themselves. They were in abject bondage and misery. They were a chaotic people, and he was to go over to them. They were reviled, a slave generation and people. What could he do with them apart from trusting God? That God, it was the will of God, and he'd made it known that he would deliver his people. Moses didn't know when. His first attempt to go among his people and reveal himself to them ended in failure. They rejected him. Not failure on his part, but on their part. They rejected that even a prince of Egypt, who was a Hebrew, should ever come and assist them. They'd rather have no trouble. They'd rather be left alone. And so he had to determine and decide to leave the royal court of Egypt and go far afield into a much lower station as a humble worker. And God kept him in that state and condition as it happened for 40 years, trusting the call of God that God at length would deliver his people. But he had to take that decision, determine to do that, and he did. And this is the text that we read here, and we'd like to explore it and work it out further. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather at 40 years of age to suffer affliction and need and all the ignominy and hostility towards the Hebrews rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin in the royal court for a season. It came into his heart to visit them. Well, whatever did he see? By faith, he was going to serve Christ, it says. Well, Christ wasn't due to come for many, many years. But he knew, he believed in God sending a redeemer, a messiah. The promise had first been made to our first parents in the Garden of Eden, that God would send a Messiah, a Saviour. It had been made more explicitly to Abraham, the forebear of Moses, and to Abraham's children, the patriarchs after him. The promise was repeated that a great descendant would come through that people, and through that descendant the whole world would be blessed or vast numbers of people in it. And there would be forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God through what this great descendant would do. He would clearly be divine. He would be God and man also. And Moses believed this. He believed the religion of his people, the one true and living God. Now, this is how he reasoned. He chose for himself what did he see? The attributes of God, what God was like, the character of the one true God. It was taught in the tradition of his people, and he believed it. The one God is nothing like the idol gods of the Egyptians, these humanly invented gods, these gods that sin and fail and fly into tempers and do treacherous things. The true God is one and the true God is kind. The true God is holy. The true God is loving. In his being, he is eternal, everlasting. He is immutable, unchangeable. He will never vary. He is perfect and that which is perfect can never change. Otherwise, it would be less than perfect. He is faithful and reliable. The one true and living God is everlasting. He will never fade, never faint, never be reduced, never be destroyed. He is transcendent above creation. He made all things. He needs no fuel. He needs no energy to be put into him from outside. 
He is the source of eternal life and energy and vigor and being. The one true God knows all things. He is a God of infinite, immeasurable intelligence. Nothing is concealed from him. He not only knows all things, but he knows all things and all things that ever have happened and all things that ever will happen at the same time. He is God, infinite, amazing, beyond our comprehension. And he's a God of amazing kindness. And here are we human beings made by him, but rebels against him, people who've seized our lives for ourselves, people who've sinned against his holy laws, and yet he in his mercy and his kindness has made a way of salvation for us. Now that way of salvation, how God does away with our sin, how God brings about our forgiveness, that was not revealed plainly to Moses, not yet, that was to come. But he did know this, that God would somehow do it. God would send a Messiah, a Savior, and on account of what that Savior would do, there was free forgiveness with God. God would forgive your sins. God would give you a new life and a new nature and a new heart. God would bring it, you to know him and to walk with him and to pray to him. God would do all these things. There was nothing like that in Egypt. There was nothing to be compared with this. To have the forgiveness of God, that to Moses was the mightiest of things. All my sin, everything I've ever done, every offensive and foul and wrong thing I've ever said, all my selfish and miserable plans, all my actions that are wrong and offensive for which I deserve to be judged, all of it to be taken away and freely forgiven and God to never hold it against me. That was such a tremendous thing, the forgiveness of God. And then Moses would have thought, and eternal life, everlasting life, life without end, with God in eternal glory, with all who love him and worship him, a place of such magnificence and amazement to have everlasting life. Why all the treasures so-called in Egypt can never match that, can never meet that, and to have a new life myself, and a new nature, and power over my sin, and to have a life which understands a new mind, which understands God and spiritual things, and can pray and communicate with him. These things are priceless. What do I have in Egypt? I have wealth, I have chariots, I have servants, I have Egyptian philosophy, I have privilege and influence and power. But oh, that's all coming to an end. And anyway, that's shallow. That doesn't explain to me the meaning of life. That doesn't do away with the record of my sin. That doesn't bring me into to communion with God. Why the Egyptians are just cluttered up with miserable and wicked gods and feeble gods that they trust in by and superstition alone, which never answer prayer, which can never help. It's just no comparison. Communion with God, understanding why life is here, why I am here, where I'm going in the eternal future. To have assurance and a definite sense and awareness that I belong to God and he has graciously received me and freely pardoned me. All these things were in the balance. Verse 26, esteeming, considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches. If in this short life people scorn me, said Moses, 
because I turn to the service of the one true God? Why, that's nothing for what God graciously does to me and for me, and I could never deserve it. It's by his grace alone, this new life, this communion with God, this forgiveness of sin, this everlasting life, this new mind and outlook, this deeper understanding, this power to form a character, and this influence with God as I pray for different people and different situations, how much he helps me, how frequently he answers my prayers. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Oh, dear friends, John Newton wrote about this, some lines in one of his best-known hymns, Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all his boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasure, none but Zion's children know. And Moses also could have said that, and that's how he thought. So he went to identify with a despised slave people without any early prospect of their deliverance, but he knew that God would bring it about. He went by faith, forfeiting all the respect that people had for him because he was going to serve the living God. Oh, we're never confronted with a decision like that when we come to Christ. We're never confronted with anything on that scale. You haven't got to leave your family. You haven't got to leave your profession necessarily, unless it's an unusually evil one. You haven't got to forfeit all you know. All you've got to forfeit is your sin and your allegiance to this world as your sole object of satisfaction and delight. All you've got to leave is the worship of yourself, what I want, what I want to be, how I fare, and turn your life over to Christ and trust in him. Nothing like as hard for you and me as it was for Moses. Moses had to come down from celebrated honor to the dust, but he saw it the other way. I am being lifted up from hopelessness and shallowness and a short, uncertain, earthly life, all its disappointments and miseries, only to go to the judgment of God. And I've been lifted up from that to know true royalty, being a member of the family of God, trusting in his forgiveness, trusting, we would say today, in Christ and the cross of Christ and his atoning death for sinners because he's purchased that salvation that Abraham and countless others acquired. And yet, although there's nothing like the same cost to us, how we hesitate, how we hold back. What will I lose if I come to Christ what will I have to forfeit? Only your sin, friends. He will enable you to give it up. He will freely pardon and forgive you when you repent of your sin, if you trust in him only. What have you got to lose? Only your sin, only your short, uncertain life where nothing will go quite as you planned, where you'll live it without the help of God, where well, you'll live it as a poor dupe and pawn to all the anti-God ideology of today, where well, you've got no answer to growing old, you've got no answer to death. If somebody asks you what is the purpose of your life, do you know why the world was brought into being, why you have had life and breath breathed into you? You don't know the answer. You can't say, I don't know. I don't know. 
I don't know the meaning of life, the purpose of life, the destiny of life. I don't know any of these things. I just go with the flow, with my temptations and desires and sins, and I live just for material things and this present earth, and I don't know anything divine, and I don't have any communion with God, and I don't have any blessing from him, and I can't say I'm going to heaven, and I'm a forgiven man or woman, and I can't say that God is in my life and that he hears my prayers. What a sad situation. And you're not being thrown out of the royal court in order to profess Christ as Abraham, as Moses would have been. You're not being deprived of everything you ever did and that you found fulfilling before. Dear friends, what sad creatures we are. But so with me, I speak for myself. I don't believe I would ever have come to Christ, ever been converted to him, ever become his child, if he had not just overwhelmed my heart, if he had not so worked in my life that, well, I just could do nothing other than repent of my sin and seek him. It's the same with you. It's his mercy that draws us, works irresistibly in our lives, brings us to himself, and we're looking here at the life of Moses and what happened in his case. Forgiveness, eternal life, communion with God, new life, a new nature. What's your nature like, friend? What's your nature like? We've all got our master sin. Is it a selfish nature? Well, everybody's is that. Is it a dishonest streak? Is it perhaps an unclean streak? What is it? It's in your nature. You used to be ashamed of it. But it happens so often that your conscience has become inured and toughened and calloused. Now it doesn't hurt you to sin anymore. Now you justify it. Seems easy. How could you ever be changed when you come to Christ? He changes your nature. He changes you in so many ways. You find you can defeat your sin with his help. You can be a new person, a different person. You're a delivered person. Moses discovered all that. That's what kept him such an unassuming, humble man, not driven by pride, not exuding conceit and arrogance for his great capacities and powers and position once he led the Israelites. That's what kept him, dear friends, the new nature that God gives, the power of God, these things are wonderful. He looked for the recompense of the reward, all the things that God would give now and eternally. Of course, he didn't believe he could ever deserve that reward. It's called a reward, but you don't earn it. You can't. It's given you freely by God when you trust in Christ. It's undeserved. Oh, there's a last little phrase I must refer to before I close. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, Pharaoh, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. How could he see the God who is invisible? How can you see God who is invisible? Well, if we if you belong to him, you'll see him one day. You'll see Christ in glory when he comes again or when he calls you to heaven as his child, if that ha whichever happens first. You'll see him, but right now you can't see him. And yet you're called to trust him, to believe in him, to give yourself to him. How do you do that? What's the evidence of him if you cannot see him? Well, and I'm coming to conclusion, you see him, well, for us it's easy. We see him in the life of Christ. We see him in 
Christ who was God, who became man and lived a perfect life and had that divine power to heal and to restore life. He walked on earth. The testimony and the record is here in the scriptures. His life, his teaching, the astonishing life of Christ who lived perfectly without sin so that he could be our sin bearer, our representative, and go to Calvary's cross in amazing love and suffer and die for all who come to him. He took our sin, our guilt upon himself and bore the punishment due to us and he purchased the right to forgive us freely and change our lives. Why? How do you see him who is invisible? For us it's easy. You see the record of his life, how he lived, how he loved lost souls, the price he paid for us, what he did, and we see in him the love of God, and we hear from his lips the promises of God, and all who come to him, he'll never turn away, so you believe in him. And then, of course, you see the evidence of God's power and being, not only in the scripture, but in all that he does for his people. Do you know Christian people? Do you have Christian friends, parents, family, for all our weaknesses and our foibles and our ways? We can tell you about the power of God. You can we can tell you about answered prayer. We can tell you about astonishing things and remarkable things. We can tell you something of the history of God's love and how he deals with his own and hearing it from us, you kind of see him who is invisible. But when you come to him and you trust him from the scripture and you say, oh Lord, to Christ, forgive me. Take my life. I have nothing to bring, nothing to contribute. Take me and change me and make me thine own. Then you see even more of him who is at present invisible to you because he takes your heart and you know he's done it and you know he's received you and you can pray in a new way and you know your prayers are being heard and you have answers to your prayers and you have a measure of power over your sin and all these things prove his being and his presence to him. You see him now with what we call the eye of faith. You see him. And Moses endured, seeing him, who to the ordinary human eye is invisible. And so do we. That's what conversion is. You're in touch with him and you prove him and love him and he changes you and blesses you and guides you and hears you and helps you. He endured and it's so much better even before we get to heaven. Life is so much better. Ask me now, what's the purpose of life? And I'll tell you. Ask me now, where are you going when you die? And I can tell you. Ask me now, how do you feel if you become very, very ill? And I'll tell you, I'm not that afraid because I know exactly where I'm going. And I have evidence so much of the hand of God upon me and upon my life. It's not just me. It's millions and millions and millions of Christian believers will all say exactly the same. Why stay as a worldling without God, without any contact with him, help from on high, without new life, without forgiveness, without eternity? Oh, dear friends, don't stay in that condition. Seek him. Seek Christ. He is the God who is there. Christ is real. 
He hears your every sincere prayer. Seek him and you'll surely find him. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, look upon us all this night. Move in every heart. O oh Lord, there's young, there is none too young to come to thee and none too old. Deal with us all. Take away our stubbornness and our foolishness. Help us to see the issues and like thy servant of so many centuries ago, O oh Lord, grant us that most real of all experiences, salvation and life in Christ. We ask it in his name for his sake. Amen.